Welcome to the Biotech Startups Podcast by Exceda. Join us as we speak with first-time founders, experienced scientists, serial entrepreneurs, and biotech investors about the challenges and triumphs of running a biotech startup. Gain actionable insight into navigating the life sciences industry in each episode as we explore the business of science from pre-seed to IPO with your host, John Chi. The purpose of the Biotech Startups podcast is to provide general insight into the ever-changing world of life sciences through the experience of a variety of guests. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from this podcast are at the user's own risk. The views expressed by guests and any employee of Exceda on the podcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Exceda or content sponsors. Any appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement or recommendation of any product, service or entity referenced in the podcast by Exceda or by its guests. My guest today is Manish Jain, CEO and co-founder of Mirvi, a life science company that predicts pregnancy complications before they happen by revealing the underlying biology of pregnancy health. Mirvi is dedicated to shaping the future of pregnancy health through simple, personalized blood tests. Prior to Mirvi, Manish has been a founder, CEO, or executive in five successful startups, which include Paralleal Bioscience, Orifex Bioscience, Ion Torrent, Butterfly Network, and Serena, all of which successfully exited or commercialized to the likes of Ephemetrics, Illumina, Life Technologies, the FDA, and Grail, respectively. Before his time as an entrepreneur, Manish was a scientist working at the Stanford Genome Technology Center. Over the next three episodes, we cover a wide range of topics, including his early desire to leverage technology to make a societal impact, his forays into entrepreneurship, and how the maternal health crisis led to Mirvi's creation. Today, we'll chat about the early years, covering Manish's inherent curiosity as a child and where his entrepreneurial drive came from. We'll also chat about his time at Stanford, his transition from physics to the life sciences, and how it led to the founding of Paralleal Bioscience. Without further ado, let's dive into episode five of the Biotech Startups podcast. Manish, it's so good to see you again. Thanks again for taking the time to be on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you, John. Um, so as we were doing some research and our homework and as a team trying to come up with where a good place to start would be, we we're thinking about turning the, cl- the hands of time back and really just thinking about your early days and what drew you to science and what drew you to entrepreneurship and what was your upbringing like um, and influenced your style when it comes to company building? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's good to look back uh, to see what has influenced your present day. Um, For science, I just was fundamentally curious. I think from my youngest days, I was just really curious about how things worked, the way they did, and whether we could actually understand that. Was it random? Was there a pattern? And so finding those patterns and the understanding of how the world worked uh, was always uh, sort of innate. I just grew up that way, I think, um, since I was born. And so that was that was um, that was the beginning of the love for science. Um, there's always a joke around my family that whenever we had a service person come in, like, uh, you know, air conditioning is broken and somebody came in to fix that. I'd be just, you know, being very annoying, peering over their shoulder, trying to check out exactly what was going on when I was out of the yeah. library. Yeah. So I was really trying to understand how things worked. Yeah. That that's amazing, and I, I, I'd imagine your parents were like, "Manish, stop! Like they have to, they actually have to fix this thing. Like I need, we need you to stop." Um, was you know when you were growing up, was your, were your was your family very like embracing of your love of science, or was there kind of a you know kind of a, a direction that they wanted you to go, or was it a kind of a environment where you can pursue kind of your own interests? Yeah. So my dad was actually the first in this family to go to college. And so I think he knew firsthand the value of education and and I think just learning. They weren't scientists, my parents, uh, but I think that that sort of uh, thirst for knowledge or like learning about the world and being ever curious, I think that was kind of uh, instilled pretty early on. And I think also with that came, I guess, some expectations. You know, my dad is always famous for saying, reach for the stars and you know, try to yeah. do, think big and, and try to do something ambitious. And so that was, I think, ingrained. Um, but alongside that, I think some of the qualities like uh, humility was pretty important in my family growing up, that even though you can achieve things, um, there are others who can achieve maybe bigger things. Uh, and and you just have to have humility for the world that, that it is and how big uh, it is and all the possibilities. Um, I think another value there growing up was perseverance. 
um, that it's not going to be an easy journey. When you're trying to do something ambitious, uh, then by definition, there are going to be failures along the way. And you have to kind of set your mind and 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 work through those and, and sort of expect that things would not be smooth. Uh, so that's something else I think that uh, I learned pretty early on growing up. And so then all, all of that really just um, led to a love of science, but then really translated to entrepreneurship because as I grew older, I was like, oh, this is great on how things work and I can start to understand that better. But now how can I use that to improve people's lives or make a societal impact? So the entrepreneurship piece really started to come in, I think at a subliminal level by knowing that I wanted to learn a lot about science, but then wanted to apply it for the greater good or produce some kind of end impact in people's lives using that. So that was, I think, some of the some of the key pieces growing up. Yeah. And I mean, those key pieces sound like a recipe for success. The, I mean, and honestly, the, you know, the, the, your, your kind of North star of humility, I think it rings true for me too. <laughs> and, and I, just a personal story. The, I, I was, I, I would like to think I was pretty good at playing lacrosse when I was younger. Um, yeah. And then when I got into like collegiate lacrosse, I was like, Oh, <laughs> this is what really good is. And, and, you know, I was like, I came in, I was just like, yeah, I, I got it figured out. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Oh my goodness, this is, <laughs> this is, I am, this is a different level. And I think yeah. it was hard for me to grapple with like at first, but I think as an entrepreneur, that's so critical, like is having that humility to understand that like, there are people who are very good <laughs> at what you're doing um, and great at other things. Um, and I've always thought, you know, as long as you can bring people who are better than you in your corner, it's a it's a win win for everybody, um, yeah. And and so I know as you were young, you know, you're younger and you're starting to you know pursue your 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 passion for science. Um, I know you ended up at Caltech. What what drew you to Caltech? Caltech being a storied institution, but what drew you personally to Caltech? And you know what what was that experience like at Caltech as an undergrad? Yeah, so I grew up in different parts of Asia, and so I think just the opportunity to when I got in the opportunity to come and do science at a high level was really exciting. And I think uh, similar to experience with lacrosse, when I got there, I thought I was, you know, hotshot, whatnot. And then it was like, oh my God, everybody here is really good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. kind of average at best. Yeah, and so yeah. I think that, that sense, um, which comes with just having a bigger pond, right? And I think it's a great learning experience to put yourself in a position where you're in the bigger pond. And first it's intimidating because you're like, wow, everybody here is so good at this craft. Uh, and and really smart. But then on the flip side, then you sort of start to up your game, right? And you kind of start to see what you can do and how you can learn from others and get better. So I think it was a great mix uh, for that to realize that, oh yeah, this is a, a much bigger environment and it's the best and brightest. And how do you compete at that level? And how do you kind of find your strengths and, and work with others to uh, make yourself better? Absolutely. And while you're at Caltech, did you have a undergraduate lab experience or was that something that came later for you? Yeah, actually it was pretty formative. Uh, so my, the summer after my freshman year, they have this program called surf. Um, and it's, it's not surfing on the beach, although that's, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that, that would be a, the dream, the dream. <laughs> uh, but it was summer undergraduate research fellowship. And that was really kind of saying, Hey, pick a topic that you're excited about. And, um, and then you can do a research program on it. So I, I got pretty interested in lasers quite early on. And I was like, oh, this is cool. You know, all these colorful focused beams of light and what happens. And there's a lot of physics behind it, of course. But those were the early days of uh, CD players, you know, if you remember those. Um, so this was a project on kind of trying to do some image processing with CD players and lasers. And I thought this was going to be a super fun project. Um, so spent the summer doing that. It was my first exposure, kind of taking things you learn in books to actually building stuff with your hands and seeing how it works. And of course, you know, the first few weeks was super frustrating. I didn't know what yeah. the heck I was doing. <laughs> and yeah. everything was falling apart. But gradually, after a few weeks, I caught on. And then at the end, we had this functioning prototype. And so that was pretty exciting to kind of take your book knowledge and, and translate it to a real thing in the world that you can do something with. Um, so yeah, great, great formative experience early on. Yeah, that that's that was my same lab experience too. Like after like this, you know, just like foundational like principles of biochemistry. I'm like, oh, like simple, like very simple. This is how the reaction will unfold. Yeah, you go under the hood, start pipetting. Data comes back. You're just like, 
that was not what was explained in the book. And yeah. this is exactly not. So where do I go from here? Um, and so as you you did your summer, you know, kind of lab first lab experience, um, was there any, I guess, mentors or professors that took you under their wing or perhaps la- left a lasting impression on you at Caltech? Yeah, I think that's always, um, you know, that's one thing I've learned in my career that it's, it's amazing when somebody uh, bets on you uh, just based on not what you know, but what you could become. And I think that's the best form of ment- mentorship for somebody to see potential in you like that. So it wasn't my summer uh, research professor, but it was another one, one of the classes I took my junior year, um, Professor Yariv, who was pretty famous in this field. And of course, he had all these famous grad students and all kinds of you know amazing research that he had done. So I took this class and then I was like, well, can I do research in their lab? And I, I fully expected to be like, well, what's your background? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. like uh, that can't be serious. Yeah. But I think it was the first example of somebody betting on me uh, in, in a way of like uh, well, beyond my parents, uh, really just kind of seeing the potential. And uh, that was pretty formative. And I, I kind of that left an impression on me over the years and certainly something that I try to do when I can now. Yeah, absolutely. And I I, I think I think back on the same PIs that took a, a chance on me. I, I was more of a liability like as, as an undergraduate in the lab. <laughs> I was like. Yeah, I, I I could have probably have a potential to mess more things up than actually add value here. Yeah. But the the early bet, and I, I think that's something, you know, that's special about the startup and entrepreneurial community is this kind of culture and then science too of just like giving back mentorship. It's almost like apprenticeship almost. Yeah. Um, that I think it's it's hard to find elsewhere. Um and so as you were wrapping up your time at, at Caltech, um, what you know, kind of what drew you to the idea of grad school? And what what kind of got you kind of piqued your in, inspiration to go to Stanford to uh, study or focus on applied physics? Yeah, um, I I knew that I wanted to do something which was a bit more applied than just theoretical. So even though I was fascinated by the theories and kind of the broader picture in, in a field like physics, I, I knew that I wanted to do something more applied. And I was still, uh, I think, from freshman year, gravitated to laser physics. So that's what I ended up doing um, at Stanford for grad school because I felt that was a field which uh, intellectually I was curious about. And I think practically was closer to making a difference in people's lives potentially, although I didn't didn't know much, but it felt like it was more applied and potentially useful. And so that sort of bent of trying to bring knowledge and use it for the greater good. Uh, I tried to carry that one step forward going to grad school. Absolutely. And and what was your grad, grad school lab experience like? And, and what was the difference like between your Caltech lab experience and then your Stanford lab experience, if, if there's a difference at all. Yeah, I think it was just that you owned the project fully and you were responsible from soup to nuts, whether it worked or didn't work. And, and you had to make it work and get some, you know, innovative results that were first of their kind to be able to graduate. Uh, and, yeah. and it's different versus then here's a project and do these pieces and, you know, you'll you'll do fine if you can get to this place. It's uh, much more open ended. And so I think um one of the skills in grad school that I learned were really, how do you take a big problem that feels very open-ended and start to break it into doable components? And like, how do you characterize the problem into pieces? And each of the pieces feels more tractable or solvable, or at least if you do these first two pieces, then the third one will be doable in the fourth. So I think taking uh, kind of problems which feel big, like big hairy problems and, and breaking them down into components and then starting to tackle them in a systematic way, but also, you know, perseverance, knowing that it's not going to be a week or a month. Sometimes it might be a couple of years till you can crack a puzzle, Uh, but really sticking with it through that time was a pretty important experience. Absolutely. And I I think there's tons of like, like kind of parallels to to entrepreneurship too. Like if you, if you know, you mentioned the hairy goal, like when you set that big, hairy, audacious goal, it looks terrifying. <laughs> like, you're just like, how am I going to do this? And I can definitely, you know, I, I find that incredibly valuable. It's like, we call it at Exceder, it's like chunking, like chunking the project into its constituent parts. Um, yeah. and, you know, I think in addition to making it more like actually manageable from a cerebral perspective, it also makes it like emotionally <laughs> more manageable because yeah. like, I think if the goal is too daunting, you kind of get paralysis. You're just like, oh, like, I don't even want to start. Like, this is too much. It almost seems impossible. Um, yeah. And and so at Stanford, you know, uh, was there, and, and in a similar vein to, you know, at Caltech, were there any mentors or professors that took you under their wing or left a lasting impression on you? 
Yeah, uh, my uh, obviously my my grad thesis advisor was uh, pretty instrumental. But one of the things I realized, which I was when I was halfway through, was like, you know, this is kind of the epiphany. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in the wrong decade. <laughs> what what is what's going on here? So yeah. when I looked at the history of the work in in a field like laser physics, it was all done in the '60s, and so a lot of the work that had been done in uh, other arenas was translated over. And there was this magic decade where they invented the whole field. So we were doing exciting stuff, but it was incremental. And so one of the biggest takeaways I actually had from grad school is like, wow, I need to be in a field which is gonna have its magic decade coming up, not the magic decade has passed a few few decades ago. And it's not necessarily a decade, but I think a lot of fields, you find that there's this period of 10 to 20 years where the field just explodes and just all the fundamentals and discoveries are made. And so then um, halfway through, I went to this talk on the Human Genome Project, which was just in the earliest stages. And I was just fascinated. I said, wow, this is going to change the field of biology uh, and going into the 21st century is going to become a quantitative science. It's going to be like we have thought of physics or chemistry of these other kind of physical sciences. The bio life sciences are going to become the same way. And then once it's quantitative, it's going to advance really fast. So that was just kind of on my aha moments, which at first wasn't the greatest feeling because it was like, well, all the stuff I've been doing. Is <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But then I, I was pretty determined. I said, wow, this is definitely how the future is going. I just feel I see it. And all this time, you know, I've, I feel I've been in the wrong decade. Now I can't yeah. right decade. And so that was really the biggest outcome is I, I sort of uh, used that to transition to life sciences. And, and that was a big leap. Uh, you know, again, going into the big unknown, I think the last time I took a biology class was high school. Yeah. Uh, and so it was a pretty big leap, but I, I somehow got convinced that it's it's the right thing to do as as the next step for myself. Yeah. And so was that when you like you, you met it was a talk that you said that you went to and you kind of did you just like like serendipitously like this looks interesting and just walk in or was there someone like, hey, like Manish, I, I recommend that you go check this out. Was it? Yeah. I, I think I was starting to, um, I don't know, halfway into grad school, I was like, what I'm doing is exciting and intellectually really challenging, and I can see the path to getting it done. But the impact is going to have, it'll be incremental because yeah. all the stuff was done in the 60s. So yeah. I actually started proactively going to different, you know, one good thing with Stanford is you can just go to so many departments. You can just go to the talks or plenary lectures in different. So I kind of, for a while, just started to once a week, just go to a talk in every different department and just kind of learn about what was going on. And so it was through the course of that that I came across this talk in the Genome Project, and that just really grabbed me. So it, it was a search. Part of it is a search process, knowing that I wanted to do something which was up and coming versus yep. had been done largely in the past. Um, and and so kind of a discovery process. It just happened to be on this talk, and um, and that was that was the beginning of that. That's amazing to be to be honest. I mean, especially during the Human Genome Project, like in its infancy and like nascent stages. Like I mean like epic like, like just like I, I could imagine there's like a very big inflection point that you're just like unlocked a bunch of opportunity and so I'm going to imagine that's kind of what led to your experience at the Stanford Stanford Genome Technology Center and how you got involved how how, how did you uh, come like uh, find that opportunity and how did you get involved yeah so I um they had been one other person I think in physics had gone over to the genome center uh, and they had this um they had a, a fa faculty member, Ron Davis, who was there, who had done a lot of really exciting stuff at recombinant DNA in, in the 70s, very famous. Um, so I just happened one day after uh, after work, I just walked over and kind of just had a chat with him. And I was like, hey, um, you know, love to know what's going on here. And we, we just got to talking about things. And he's like, yeah, you should definitely come work here. I'm like, I'm like, well, that's fantastic. You know, thanks for the opportunity. But let me just be clear. I, I know nothing about biology. Yeah. <laughs> no, no biochemistry. Just so yeah. many misunderstandings. Yeah. I don't know this field, right? <laughs> yeah. said, Actually, that's perfect. The fact that you're a clean slate is awesome because this field is getting reinvented and we need the new ways of thinking and foundational ways of thinking. So I said, okay, great. I'm in. I mean, that's that's enough for me. Wow. Like you have an opportunity. So uh, jumped in there, uh, went to the Genome Center, uh, spent the first two years learning a lot about biology and biochemistry. I had a lot to catch up. Stuff had happened yeah. since high school. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> I, I'm, that's an understatement. <laughs> yes. And one of the great things about that that I learned also is you learn a lot from, um, obviously, from books and, and experts, but you also learn from people practicing um, by, you know, biochemists and molecular biologists who were around the lab, uh, competition biologists. So 
just being immersed in an environment where you had different skill sets, but you could work together to try to solve this problem, which we often find in life sciences, right? It's pretty unique. Like the breadth of skill sets we need is everything from computational to the lab and product and marketing. I mean, it's such a um, broad uh, breadth of skills that you need to solve life science problems compared to, you know, if you're building an app that needs some skills too, but it's a relatively narrower set of skills than what you do in life sciences. So I think it was really a good experience from um, just learning what, how the different things work together, how different people work together and what were the strengths of different backgrounds and how you could leverage those. So um, pretty exciting experience. And um, also what was exciting about that is it, I found a direct link to what I'd been wanting to do, which is translate some of this knowledge to products that could actually help people's lives. And so um, out of the Genome Center at Stanford, there had been several spinoffs in the past. And so, you know, those guys would come in and talk about the companies they had started and like how their experiences were. So that was a great learning experience. Um, so I think that was a process first couple of years of you know, switching to life sciences and feeling like, oh my gosh, am I going to ever know this field? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but I came up to speed thanks to the help of many people there. Uh, and then after that, we started to work on projects and started to say, well, we're doing these different projects. Which of these can actually be worthy of a startup? And so um, sort of the second two or three years there uh, was really focused on saying, which of these technologies could really be uh, distinctive enough and impactful enough that it's worth starting a company? Very cool. Um, and and was th was that what led to Paralio Bioscience? Or was yes, that a for sure? And, and I guess a, a, one question. So I know a lot of our listeners are just contemplating, you know, starting a company, and they are they may be in grad school. Um, what was your experience like with that actual spin out process? Like, did you have to go through tech transfer? Was there a lot of red tape that you had to work through, or was Stanford just like? Hey, like we can, it's pretty simple. We can, we can spin out a company, no problem. Um, Cause I know every experience is a little bit different there. Yeah. There's, um, there's relatively less red tape, but I, I'd say in terms of the process, it's pre pretty much individual driven. So I think a couple of lessons, um, you, you do want some co-founders, ideally one, at least apparently we had quite a few co-founders it turned out, but, um, but you really want at least one other co-founder. And, and part of that is just being able to not just divide responsibilities, but also bounce ideas off each other and, and trust uh, in each other. So that I think that that piece is quite important for companies. Uh, I think the other part is like really um, go as far as you can in academia, because it, it'll, as far as academia is concerned, they will, the, the IP is typically at the university, which you would license as a company and typically lead to a publication. And that's also valuable for the university. So you are actually contributing usefully to the university. But if the technology has big error bars, by which I mean, you know, the key performance pieces that you need um, to know that it's viable and feasible, you don't want huge error bars in there. Because yeah. when you start a company and you take somebody's money, uh, even if it's seed money or venture money, the clock starts. There's definitely a clock that starts. And and that clock doesn't like two big error bars on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a, yeah, that's exactly it. And yeah. I, I I think, you know, uh I, I've heard kind of, you know, some similar to those error bars. Some some sometimes the spin out takes place. You go through the you spin every you, you spin your wheels and then you figure out a little bit too late that the error bars are too big. Yeah. And it's just like Oh, I wish I had. I wish that I had known this before. Um, but I also think you're absolutely right. Like the, what you pointed out about the, the clock ticking is important for these soon to be entrepreneurs to know, because like it almost feels like the the fundraise is like the battle or, you know, yeah. the old, or, or the war. But yeah. without the war connotation, it's like job done. Yeah. Uh, financing is secured. But that's just the start. That That's not even your journey hasn't even started yet like or like you haven't like gone through it and i think it's important for everyone to know it's like that right when you get it it's when the hard work begins um yeah. as much as fundraising is quite hard work as well um so you you know you with your co-founders at for parallel bioscience were these the folks that you're working at uh worked with at the genome center as well it was yeah yeah. Awesome. So what what ended up happening is I ended up working with a few different groups on a few different projects. So we were doing, we built the, um, I think the second microarray scanner. So the first one had been invented by Pat Brown at Stanford in the biochem department. So I had the skills to kind of build those devices. So we built the microarray scanner 
at the genome center. And so we started to do gene expression studies, right? So the first time you could do hundreds of genes and then potentially the whole transcriptome uh, that you could do on the chip. But then you could also start to put down um, uh, oligos to do genotyping on chips. And so now again, instead of using TACMAN to do the genotype of one or two things or a few things at the same time, you could do hundreds and thousands at the same time. And so I start, this idea of like being able to scale these technologies eventually to get to a genome wide scale, um, became pretty interesting. So there was different teams I worked with, and then eventually we got convinced that this idea we had on doing high throughput genotyping was going to be pretty powerful. And so this was really combining the best of microarrays and the best of molecular assays uh, to do genotyping at a large scale. So instead of doing one or two at a time, you could do thousands to ten thousands at a time. And so that was that felt uh, good on a few aspects. We were very naive. It was our first company. <laughs> but what we knew is that the technology had legs, that if it worked, it would scale and wouldn't stop scaling for, till quite a bit, um, that we could uh, leverage some existing platforms like microarrays as a readout. So we didn't have to build everything from scratch by ourselves. We just had to have a great assay. And then just from our work that was going on at, at that point in human disease, people were trying to do these things where they could um, link certain areas of the genome to certain diseases, but then you needed to now find which particular alleles or genotypes would be responsible. So there was a lot of excitement in the field to do that. So it was a big unmet need. So at, at a minimum level, which I'd recommend to any founder is like, you know, make sure you see a big unmet need. And it doesn't have to be that you nail the perfect application, but there has to be a couple of applications where there is unmet need. And then make sure your technology feels like it's a significant enough step that it has legs and it can scale over time. And then the exact application and the exact product and the spec, there's time for that. But I think you want to make sure the technology has legs. And if you are going to hit any big roadblocks, that you do that before taking money. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. the clock starts, the clock starts, right? That's just yeah. how it works. <laughs> yeah. And, and and you also said something really fascinating to me about building on microarrays. Um, and and that, that's something too that I think is a, a very interesting and, and I think valuable insight is that you're de-risking a little bit. Like you're not rebuilding the platform from scratch. Like, you know, Pat Brown, you know, shouts out Pat Brown for kind of sending the, the platform there. And that yeah. I would imagine makes it much more easy to, you know, you like, you don't have to recreate the wheel. And, and that also from a, you know, from a science standpoint, and also fundraising standpoint, it probably builds some, a little bit more conviction and de-risks it from the, you know, whether it's a seed or a, a series eight through all the letters yeah. um, is incredibly invalu invaluable too. Yeah. Um, and for Paralel Bioscience, was was this venture uh, venture backed or was it bootstrapped or how, how did you go about financing this spin out? Yeah, a little bit of both. So we we had a, a retreat in, in Lake Tahoe and went on this hike. And that's where we kind of had the germ of the idea of, of doing this stuff. So we were pretty excited. Um, we couldn't actually raise venture money till 2001 because it was it was a pretty, as you know, the, the, the dot-com yeah. bust. That was a tough environment. So our first sort of first encounter with a tough environment to raise money. Uh, so it took us a while. We actually, I think, closed our Series A in late 2001. But we started the company in 1999. And we initially did it out of um, a little bit of work at the Genome Center, which was published, and the IP was Stanford IP. And then we used just a little bit of individual money that we had um, to get the company spun out and, and on a very shoestring budget and just tried to make sure we crossed this milestone of um, showing the basic scalability. So I think one of our milestones, we, we, I mean, our ambitions were we could genotype up to 10,000 in a single assay. But I think when we... When we were starting out, we could barely do a couple of genotypes, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but what we knew is if you could make a couple of work, then it would scale. Um, and so I think there was some milestone with uh, when we took venture money is we had to demonstrate at least 100, I think 50 or 100 in parallel. We could do that. And then the six-month milestone for the company was to demonstrate 1,000 and then went from there. So what we did do, I think that was... Um, there were many areas we made mistakes and we were naive. But what yeah. we did do very well is we laid out this tech roadmap. And we had a pretty good sense of how much work it would take to get to the next level. And at least for the first year or two, we had some predictability. And ultimately, I think that's what helped us raise money. Because we, while we were having discussions throughout 2001, I think a lot of investors, potential investors saw that we were actually executing to the roadmap and working as a team. And that's really compelling, right? I think that's sort of a group of individuals that can work with complementary skills and advanced goals in unison. That's very attractive. And actually, it's not always easy to find. Um, and, and that I think is one of the key ingredients. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I I always uh, when I'm I'm talking to colleagues or or folks who are you know as early days of a startup, like the the roadmap and the projections that you're describing, like when you provide it to a potential you know VC partner, um, yeah. and and the, if they say no, like they now have that roadmap. Yeah. Nothing is stopping you from going back to them and saying, "Hey, it's been six months, and look, we we hit the we hit the the next step, the six month road uh, milestone." And that is such a, you know, it's like, oh, they're doing exactly what they said they would do. And that opens up a bunch of doors, even though it might have been initially a a no, let's talk later about it. Um, I think there's a that kind of operational like discipline and kind of like a little bit of foresight goes a long way. Yeah. Um, and and I know after, you know, after your time at Parale uh, Parale 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 Bioscience, um, you know, there was a merger with Affymetrics. How did that, you know, what led up to that? And what was your experience going through, you know, your first company and then a, and a merger? Yeah. Um, so in some ways, it was a pretty natural fit because I think from day one, we had been, the microarrays we'd been using to read out our assays had been the, made by Affymetrics. We used other approaches too, like Agilent. So we wanted to make sure there were at least a couple of platforms that we had viability on. Uh, but it was a pretty natural fit with what Affymetrics could do and very scalable. So I think there was that piece that was always a natural fit. And I think it really came down to uh, after our Series B, I think realizing, are we going to raise a lot of money and commercialize this ourselves, build our own sales team, or should we just partner? And we had a we had initially a commercial relationship that we had, uh, I think it was non-exclusive, but with, with Affymetrics to distribute our product. And that had been going pretty well. So I think that kind of led to two and two together and realizing, hey, we could uh, come in and have this whole massive sales team, which back then, if you don't, if you remember the heyday, 2000, early 2000s was the heyday for Affymetrics. It was an um, yeah. amazing company with amazing yeah. growth. Yeah. Uh, it's the pre illumina story, of course, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was an exciting environment. Their head of sales who actually became a mentor over time, uh, Greg Fergus, he's a fantastic guy. And I think just uh, we just kind of knew that they were going to be a great commercial partner for us. That I mean, that sounds like it. Like when the when the the team the merger when there's alignment like that there's nothing better um yeah. the and you know it seemed and then you had a working relation a pre-existing working relationship um which is which is fantastic so you know what it's going to be like on a on after the the merger um and post merger i i know you were leading global marketing for Affymetrics. what was the, you know you you were running your own you know first spin out and now you're at a very large organization you know doing global like global yeah. mar uh marketing. What, how was that transition for you? And what was that experience like? Yeah, I think it was just a fantastic learning experience overall, because it, it started with really just uh, being uh, doing marketing and product marketing for all the parallel products. And then it was uh, kind of all DNA products. And then I think then we started to do segments, academic and pharma. And then I was doing uh, global marketing on the pharma segment, which was a pretty interesting area. Um, it was honestly, I, I call it you know, some people talk about, a lot of people often ask the value of an MBA and there's definitely value, but I, I call my experience at Affymetrics the sort of portable or real yeah. portable because it yeah. was, it was for Affymetrics, it was the best of times and worst of times, right? Uh, it, it, because it was the first time they had this really strong challenger in Illumina and they had a thesis that they, um, Affymetrics really believed um, that by scaling microarrays to larger and larger arrays, you could put all the information of the genome on there and you never needed to do DNA sequencing. And it turned out in retrospect that it wasn't the right bet, but it's very hard to say that in the yeah. moment. Yeah, uh, but That was their thesis. And so they actually had the chance to buy Illumina really early on, which a uh, few people know that and they could have easily uh, bought the company oh. and changed the course of history, but uh, oh passed my up goodness. on that. Yeah, passed up on that. And um, I think there was also, while they did the right thing by bringing in parallel for targeted genotyping, they, they did have this very strong culture of invented within Affymetrics. And that always meant, because I think they had had so much success with the whole transcriptome on a chip, they definitely wanted to do the whole genome on the chip as well when it came to DNA. So the bias was to do whole genome versus targeted. And we all know the challenges with that, right? I think whole genome gives you a lot of information, but it doesn't give you always the precise information you need to make specific decisions, especially as you move to clinical applications. So I think that was an interesting uh, to see that internally. Uh, but I think most of all, it just taught me a lot about what is really product differentiation and, and how does competition work and what are technology life cycles? Like, you know, technology which can seem breakthrough 
five years later can be on the brink of obsolete, right? It's just, this is how fast technology can move. Uh, and and so that was a very interesting uh, learning experience. In fact, it was, it was the reason I actually first decided to go into industry from, from uh, the Genome Center, because we did this project on doing high throughput sequencing. And so we're building this device, which had 384 lanes. So remember, we do billions now, right, routinely. Uh, but back in the day, people thought it was pretty crazy to do 384. Why would you do, want to do more than you know a handful? Because yeah. you don't have that much sequencing to do, so it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So again, the world changes dramatically. Um, but what I saw there is we were far ahead as this academic project. But the moment the Human Genome Project got funded and announced, and there was this big race between ABI and Celera, they just took off. Like in the year, it was night and day. They had developed all this stuff that put hundreds of people on it. And so I was just so impressed with how fast industry can move when there is a big unmet need and there's competition. And so that some of those lessons which brought me to industry, I think really got refined and honed at Affymetrics to think about product, true differentiation, um, how do technology, you know, life cycles work, how do market cycles work, uh, so really a great experience for all that. And Affymetrics definitely lived through that whole cycle. Yeah, yeah. And 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 like I, I I'm I'm jealous, honestly. I, I would I, I saw it from as a, a bystander and a customer. I was like yeah. seeing kind of things unfold. And what kind of like what as I'm hearing this story, what I'm thinking about is like the innovator's dilemma or a little bit of counter positioning. Like Affymetrics had this like developed platform and IP, and there was Illumina coming with this new technology, disruptive technology, and which, which kind of goes counter to everything that you've built thus far. And that's always a really hard position to be in. We're like, well, we've put all this time and money and resources and blood, sweat and tears into this. You know, we're just like going to pull ahead. But then there's like something you just you don't know either. Like, it could have yeah. gone a different way. Like, it could have definitely gone a different way. Um, but in retrospect, obviously, you can kind of connect the dots. Um, but so like, because I, I was like reading Clay Christensen's book on it, um, but hearing that just now is like, oh, this is in practice kind of like what's happening. And, and I'm, I'm very jealous of that experience <laughs> um, to be frank. That's all for today's episode of the Biotech Startups podcast. We hope you enjoyed our insightful conversation with Manish Jain. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review and share it with your friends. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to having you join us again for part two of our conversation with Manish, where we talk about his experience founding Aurifex Bioscience, scaling go-to-market at Ion Torrent, and working with the FDA while at Butterfly Network. The Biotech Startups Podcast is brought to you by Exceda. Don't want to miss an episode? Make sure to search for Biotech Startups Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and click subscribe. To learn more about our leasing program, visit our website www.exedr.com. We provide research labs with equipment leases on founder-friendly terms to support a path to exceptional outcomes. On behalf of the team here at Exceda, thanks for listening.